Hello, and welcome to the 2020 National Science Olympiad Astronomy Webinar. The topic for this year will be star and galaxy formation and evolution. Before I start, I'd just like to mention that we're supported by a combination of NASA Astrophysics Division and the Chandra X-ray Observatory in collaboration with National Science Olympiad. Specifically, we're supported by NASA's Universe of Learning, which can be found at that link there. They have many general astronomy-related resources on their website. In addition, Chandra has the same general resources available, and also some Science Olympiad-specific resources, such as this year's webinar, and also the webinars from previous years. Now, without further ado, let's dive straight into the 2020 rules. Keep in mind that these are still draft rules at the time that I'm recording this webinar, and they may change between now and when the rules are released in early September. Changes from last year are highlighted in red. So as I said, the topic for this year is star and galaxy formation and evolution. In addition, there's a couple small changes to the resources that you're allowed to bring. So this year you'll be either allowed to bring a computer or tablet, and a three-ring binder, or two computers or tablets. The reason for this is that this year it's much more likely that you'll be using JS9. While you should still store all your computer-based resources offline, you may be required to use the internet to answer JS9 questions, as JS9 is a web-based tool. Moving on to the topics for this year, as you can see, there's some changes, and it's much more tilted towards distant galaxies and cosmology. So as you see there on the list is things like quasars and AGNs, but also dark matter, dark energy, and the cosmic microwave background. Similarly, the math that you're required to know is much more galaxies and cosmology based. So things like Hubble's law and redshift. And as usual, there's an entirely new list of DSOs. So here I've tried to categorize the DSOs by what category I think they're most relevant to. Keep in mind that a lot of these will overlap between categories and belong to multiple of them. But this is, I think, a good starting place to think about these DSOs. So let's start with our first DSO. This is 3C273. It was the first quasar discovered in 1959. It's first found in the radio, which is why quasar is short for quasi-stellar radio source. And in the years since its discovery, we've discovered that this is pretty typical of what we now define a quasar to be. It's observable at many wavelengths. We first found it in the radio, but we can see it up through and including the X-ray. And in addition, its brightness varies over the course of months. So this is what led astronomers to theorize that whatever produces a quasar must be smaller than light months in size in order for the light to change from one end to the other. And so now we think that most quasars are a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy. This black hole is surrounded by an accretion disk of very hot material, and sometimes it will eject a jet perpendicular to this disk. Our next DSO is NGC 2623. This is a pair of merging galaxies. In the upper image there, you can see that there's a lot of star formation, uh, which is seen in blue because the young stars are generally very hot. And all of the star formation has been triggered by the collision of these two galaxies as the gas collides with more gas and compresses. In addition, you can see that there are tails that have been flung out, and this is just stars and dust that have been flung out by the gravitational interaction. This DSO is what's known as an LIRG, or Luminous Infrared Galaxy. And what this means is that there's a lot of star formation, and therefore that because of this, the galaxy is very bright in the infrared, because the dust that surrounds young stars is absorbing a lot of the visible light. And it's also thought that there's an active galactic nucleus that's hidden behind all of this dust in the center of the galaxies. Our next DSO is M87, also commonly known as Virgo A. This is a giant elliptical galaxy in the nearby Virgo cluster. Um, like many other active galaxies, it has a supermassive black hole in its center that's surrounded by hot gas. And what makes this particular black hole special is that it was imaged by the Event Horizon Telescope, and that result was released earlier this year. In addition, the very prominent jet that you see from M87 in those upper images there, this jet appears to move faster than the speed of light. But it's not actually moving faster than the speed of light. This is a relativistic effect based on the fact that the jet is coming towards us. And so based on this jet and other active galaxies, there's a theory called the unified model 
that all active galaxies are really just the same thing, but we're viewing them from different angles, whether the jet's pointed directly towards us, or off in a perpendicular direction, or some other angle. Last of the quasars that we have on this year's DSO list, there are the three quasars. Um, these are thick disk quasars, where it's thought that the disk around that supermassive black hole has puffed up due to a lot of material falling in. And this disk tends to block a lot of light, which means that these quasars are identified by being weak in ultraviolet and also X-ray. And the reason that these thick disks are important is because that this allows the central black hole of the quasar to grow very rapidly. And it may be fast enough to explain how early black holes got so massive so quickly. So our next couple of DSOs have to do with what's called WIM, or Warm Hot Intergalactic Medium. So this DSO here, H2356-309, this is a quasar beyond the sculptor wall of galaxies, which is a local structure that has many, many galaxies in it. So this particular quasar is what's known as a blazar, which means that its jet is pointed directly at us, and therefore it's very bright and has a very, very distinct spectrum. So the reason that this is relevant to WIM is that WIM is one of the possibilities for explaining the missing matter of the nearby universe. There's a lot of hydrogen, helium, etc. that we expect to see based off our theories of the Big Bang, but in the nearby universe, we seem to have a shortage of this matter. So WIM is really hard to detect because it's very hot and also very, very diffuse. But if you have enough of it, such as in the sculptor wall, then a quasar shining through it towards us will pass through enough WIM that we actually see the absorption from it. Similarly, our next DSO, H1821 plus 643, this is a quasar at the center of what's called a cooling core cluster. And it's so named because the center of this cluster is cooler than its edges, because the way it radiates energy is proportional to its density, and the center is the densest part. So likewise, this one is also used to detect WIM, because wind between the quasar and us will absorb x-rays. However, like I said earlier, this is very, very weak absorption. So in order to make this detection, they had to stack a lot of Chandra observations. So now let's move on to our next category of DSOs, which is galaxy clusters. The first of these DSOs is the bullet cluster. This is actually a merger of two galaxy clusters. In the upper image there, you can see that there's a lot of x-ray emission from the colliding gas, and this is in x-rays because it's very, very hot. However, most of the mass of a galaxy cluster is actually made of dark matter, which doesn't collide with anything. And so the bullet cluster is actually one of our best proofs of dark matter, in that the mass distribution that we see based on the galaxies in it is very, very different from the mass distribution that we can determine from gravitational lensing. And so there must be some invisible mass and this invisible mass is dark matter. And in addition, that dark matter will lens the background galaxies. Our next DSO is MACS J0717. So this is a very complex colliding cluster in that there's four subclusters astronomers have determined based on the positions of where the galaxies are versus where their gas is, since the gas will collide while the stars will generally pass through each other. Uh, as such, there's a lot of x-rays from all this superheated colliding gas. And in addition, we've been able to determine the mass distribution of this colliding cluster based on how it lenses the galaxies behind it. The lensing also brightens the galaxies in the background, allowing them to be studied as well as the ones in this cluster. Another cluster is MACS J1149. So this cluster is mostly known as a very, very powerful gravitational lens. So among the things it's lensed are a very, very distant galaxy that you can see up there, which is at redshift 9.6. So this means that the universe was only 500 million years old when the light from this galaxy was emitted. In addition, it's lensed the furthest star ever found which was given the wonderful name of MACS J1149 Lens Star 1, or the better name of Icarus. So this star is a single star that we can see at a distance of 14.4 billion light years. In addition, 
Another object that has been lensed by this cluster is supernova Revstal, which is the first supernova with multiple lensed images. And scientists were actually able to predict when the next image would show up based on the distribution of mass that they had determined for the cluster. Finally, our last cluster is JKCS041. So this is the most distant and oldest galaxy cluster known. It's at a redshift of about 1.9, which means that it's about 10 billion light years away. And so because this cluster is so far from us, light from it takes a while to get here, and from it we can track the early star formation of the universe. And from this cluster, we've discovered that many massive galaxies in the universe actually already stopped forming stars by 10 million years ago. And a question that's still open for investigation is whether galaxies grow primarily due to colliding with other galaxies and getting larger, or do they grow via some other means? So this kind of leads into our next category of DSOs, which is DSOs that tell us something about the early universe. The one that I have here, supernova UDS-10 Will, is the furthest type 1a supernova ever discovered. This was found at a redshift about 1.9, which means that the universe was only about one third of its current size. This was found by the Hubble Candle Survey, which is specifically searching for these faint and distant supernovae. And specifically, they're searching for type 1a's, because type 1a's are used as standard candles to measure distances. And so it's really important to know whether these supernova have changed their characteristics between the ones that we observe nearby and the ones that we observe in the early universe. The next DSO, it's Good South. 29323. Uh, this was also found in Hubble survey, and specifically they were searching for objects that match their predictions of what early supermassive black holes might have looked like. So it's thought that instead of having to um, accrete matter by spiraling it around in a disk until it reaches the black hole, early supermassive black holes might have just been a gas cloud that collapsed directly in. So scientists looked through the Hubble surveys for these very, very red objects that they expect to be infrared bright because all this gas and dust in this disk should absorb and re-emit the light. And so they did find these objects such as this one here.